All right, so this is the second episode of The Last Zebra, and I have the honor of Dr. Shami Gupta, my previous nephrology <laughs> attending. Probably, I still think of him as my attending. <laughs> um, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for coming through. Yeah, this is quite amazing, Ugo. Really thrilled to be here today and, and uh, proud to see that you created what you said you were going to create. Really. <laughs> I know, I know. We were just talking uh, with the last guest about how long it's been since I've wanted to do this. Certainly since, co- since, since residency, for sure. And the name The Last Zebra has a special tie to my residency, um, Shaber, Shaber Medical Center, which is where I met you. Yeah, it's, it's, a, uh, it's been a great ride meeting a lot of the folks from Shaber. Actually, I've been working at Shaber Medical Center since 2001 when I was just a young, right out of residency, basically, working yeah. there as a moonlighter and providing care at this little country hospital mm-hmm. solely to pay the bills and... And it's become my home for the last 22 years now, where I've had the pleasure and opportunity to train residents and meet folks and, and uh, get to know them, see their journey from medical student to resident to uh, successful doctors like uh, we are here today. Oh, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What, what would you say is the driving factor that keeps you there in a place like that? Because, yeah. you know, you live, you know, an hour away from it. The drive is a, is a factor. But what and you've been doing this now for almost two decades. Yeah, I get that question often. Uh, I'm a Louisianian through and through, born and raised, uh, born in New Orleans, Baton Rouge, lived in New Orleans and moved to Lafayette when my father was uh, in his early medical days and always thought of Lafayette as my home mm-hmm. and, the, and the scale of the town, the way it was. And I would have moved back there had I met my wife now of 26 years. <laughs> that was my plan and like all good plans. Yeah. Uh, they often don't go the way you think, but often turn out better. Uh, and so I was seeking out, uh, I was hoping to work in a place like that, but uh, moved to New Orleans and thought I'd be a New Orleans doctor. And mm-hmm. through circumstance, necessity, uh, child being born, Hurricane Katrina, kind of ended up back over there. Uh, I used to moonlight there. And I always loved the scale, the people, the patients, and uh, really felt like you're making a difference in a way that was different than a big hospital system. Right. So that's what keeps me going every day. And, and really being able to see patients face to face, one on one, impact them directly. And, um, we have the added benefit there, of course, of having trainees, which is one of my other passions and educating young doctors and, and seeing them evolve and grow mm-hmm. up and, and provide care for the most of the need in our state. You know, we're, we're a state that lacks doctors in rural markets. So yeah. that's another thing that drives me to be there. It's yeah. definitely a unique training experience. I think there's an element of, of belonging, especially mm-hmm. where the patients are concerned. They have... I, I feel like South Louisiana has some of the most appreciative patients, some of the, the patients that have a certain level of, and, and reverence is not the right word, right. but you feel like you're truly making an impact in someone's life. And the South Louisiana culture, you know, yeah. the Southern, Southern living, what's, what's that phrase? Um, like Southern happiness or, mm-hmm. so, you know, yep. Southern hospitality right. manifests itself in how your patients treat you. I mean, I have oh. patients that would bring their meat from their most recent uh-huh. hunt. If they go fishing, they bring That's the fish right. and they treat you like their own family and they talk to you that way yeah. too, which kind of harkens mm-hmm. back to old medicine and that right. leaves such an imprint on someone like me who trained in that, in that uh, arena. Yeah, once you, once you get used to that, it's hard to go to a big system. Mm. You know, I think a lot of big system folks like the big systems and probably can't go to the small systems, whereas mm-hmm. small system folks can practice it either mm-hmm. but are attracted to that. Even today, for example, uh, and pretty coincidentally for the podcast, one of my longstanding patients, the wife, um, texted me today because I'm like, why would she have my right. number? <laughs> she has my number because we live in a hurricane zone and as a kidney doctor, right. your patients need to be able to get in touch with you if they right, need to evacuate. Right. So she texted me that she made a fresh gumbo yesterday and actually dropped it off to me at the hospital in an ice chest, in ice. <laughs> I don't have to bring anything and, and told me to enjoy it. And it just made you feel so good. Right. You know, and she didn't need to do that, obviously, but she wanted to. And, and those little things keep you going in these complicated medical worlds that we're in when you're getting beat down. It's a moment like that that really just makes you feel special mm-hmm. and privileged to take care of patients. And sometimes feeling sorry is the wrong word, but I feel sorry for people that don't get to feel that all the time. 
or at least had that part of their day. You right. know? And I think that's something that we don't often advertise as doctors, that the good and the bad, but there's mm-hmm. a lot of good. You know, and, and I think some places have more good than others. And right. I think Shabir is one of those places that really has way more good than bad because it's still about the patients and, and, and teaching, you know, which I really think is what it's all about. Yeah, it's truly an institution of substance. Yep. I mean, it's designed to be a charity hospital, at least the way I understand it. And the charity ends up being both ways, right? So the patients help us out in so many ways. Yeah. And as much as we help them from a medical perspective... Yeah, the trust is still there. There's a lot, not a lot of doubt of the physician right. because they believe we're sincere and, and we're taking the time. So even if there's a setback, there's not a loss of trust in my experience. And that's mm. what I've experienced over two decades there. That you have bad outcomes sometimes or challenging outcomes, but patients still trust that you did your best and you put your best foot forward and you were looking out for them. And right. if it doesn't turn out the way they wanted it to, it's not anyone's fault in particular. Right. It was, right. Uh, you know, it was that person's destiny, time, fate, mm-hmm. but uh, there's a lot of trust that sometimes is lost in today's modern medicine when it becomes depersonalized, Right, and I hope that we never experience that there, although it's intruding slowly you know, through things like the electronic medical record and mm-hmm. different types of physicians coming and going, but our core is still there, and I think we're true to our values, so I hope that remains, you know, and it takes uh, our trainees staying around and coming back and, and, and working in those environments and bringing that cyclical feel to it. So, yeah. yeah. It feels like family. Everybody knows each other there. And er- over time, it feels like everybody knows each other, has known each other for a long time. Yep, it sure is. Yeah. I mean, I know you're in the market now working at, at, the, at, a, at a hospital nearby, but mm-hmm. we have at least four of our graduates now who've joined us right. you know, and are working in our hospital right. with us in a hospital they were students in or residents in and are truly giving back, right. which th- that really gives you a sense of pride when you see that particular piece when you're discussing a case with one of your former students or residents, not your colleague. You know, that's uh, that's that's very powerful, actually, to see that. What's that shift like? Because yeah. it took me a while. I mean, when I've, I've called you Dr. Gupta for more, <laughs> for longer than I've not called you Dr. Gupta. Yeah, sure, sure. So that that transition, it took me probably a year to actually feel comfortable. Sure. Not to, how is that on the other side? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I have people I still call doctor, you know, who yeah. are my mentors. I still feel uncomfortable calling them by their first name. They probably never will. Okay, but and as I joked around with you and I said... You know, when you social, when you end up socializing with your former trainees, that makes it easier. Right, right. And when they start buying drinks and food, <laughs> then they can call you by your first right, name. Right, so right, right. When the, when the sh- payment shifts, then you can use the first name. But, uh, <laughs> but kidding aside, you know, it, it it is it's very it's a great moment, really. It's really to think that this person is now your colleague. Right. And all this separates us. And one of my mentors told me when I was a resident that all this separates me and you is 10, 15, 20 years of time. Mm. So one day you'll be me, and mm-hmm. you'll be training someone like you, and. Always remember that, mm-hmm. and going forward, that that that's what the beauty of medicine is. That we've all experienced the same journey, maybe slightly differently, but right. the same steps of the journey right. haven't changed. You come in Pun as intended a, a, you, steps. You, yeah, you come in as a, a, a green medical student who doesn't know anything, mm-hmm. and you think it's going to be better as an intern. Then you become an intern, and you're really scared all the time. You don't know what you're doing. Then you'll be better when I'm a resident. Right. That's another big step up, and going through fellowship and beyond there's this constant uh, challenges you face that we all can identify with, Mm -hmm. which I think makes our profession very, very unique because anybody you meet has been through the same steps you have. Absolutely. And that that ties us together in a very powerful way, no matter what your level is at the current moment. Absolutely. I think certainly with with each of those steps, and I think now as an attending, which is still weird for me to say, so much of my doctor personality is tied to the people that train me yep so much of who i am as a physician i i have these different voices that kind of dictate how i operate Mm -hmm. and it makes my style of medicine relatively Mm -hmm. unique but um it's it's truly one of my pleasures one of the great pleasures of being out of training is being finding out that you can practice kind of in your own way, but a lot of your own way is just who trained you. Yeah, you're just basically an aggregate of all the folks that touched Absolutely. you along the way. Absolutely. And even people you think that didn't touch you or you didn't weren't close to, they do. Oh, yeah. And you still find yourself saying something that they might have said or thinking something they might have thought because now you experience what they were experiencing. Right. And you didn't have that ability when you were a trainee. Right. You didn't see a patient like they were seeing. Now you are in a in a volume a lot of more volume. So I think that's those eye opening moments when you're walking around and you say, actually, oh yeah, I know, that's how Dr. X did it or Dr. Y did it. And I can see why they thought that way at the moment when I didn't understand it. 
when I was a resident. Right. So I think that, and the beauty of that, it keeps on happening. It's not going to ever stop happening as long as you stay immersed mm -hmm. in the world and the, in the field and, and having trainees around you and younger people keeps that fire going because you keep getting asked sometimes the same questions, but in a different way. Right. Or you get better at explaining it or you see the light bulbs go off in their brains and then you think, well, I have a, I have a graduate now who's like so-and-so. You, you, know, you remind me of Dr. Ozema or you remind me of Dr. Patel. Or, mm. you know, so now you have this library of residents when you stay in one place for a long time. Right. And then you see, you see residents, like they're, they're like that resident. Mm -hmm. They're going to be successful like them or they're not going to be successful like this resident. So you create your own database in your mind and you see those common personality traits that you know is going to drive someone to be successful or beyond the normal successes that right. they could have. So I think that's very, you don't know that's going to happen to you when you're in this world, if you're, especially in one place for a long, long time. Right. Yeah. So you're a nephrologist. Mm -hmm. How did you get to nephrology? I think yeah. um, in residency, nephrology, especially by your influence, we, we, and I feel like a lot of our residents have, you have such a tremendous impact in our residency that, I think we make nephrologists, <laughs> and I, I, I describe my program, Shaber, as a mini nephrology fellowship. Yeah. Um, and so your influence impacts, impacted us all on a very wide scale. How, how did you get to be a nephrologist? Yeah, a great question. You know, like most medical students, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I knew what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to be a surgeon. I, I was not technically as sound to cut and, and do those kinds of things. I didn't like the rotation, so I threw those out. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd be an internist. I wanted to be a good old-fashioned regular doc in the, mm -hmm. in the clinic, old-fashioned. My dad was an anesthesiologist. Mm -hmm. Didn't want to do anything like that. I wanted patient-facing. Then I went to clinic. Uh, I don't know if I can do medicine clinic all day long, <laughs> but frankly, I'm like, this is just, this all day would be tough. Right. So then I toured with med peds. I toured with med psych, all these things. Wow. But I was influenced by a doctor when I was a third year student. Mm -hmm. I was a, a, doing a rotation in Lafayette at UMC. One of my dad's friends uh, was a chairman of nephrology, chairman of medicine there, but also a nephrologist. Gotcha. So I remember this very powerful moment. I can still remember to this day, clearly, sitting in Morning Report, uh, having a resident struggle presenting a case. Mm -hmm. And they weren't, were kind of all over the place. And you could see him getting fidgety. The chairman was listening to the case and getting, getting a little impatient. Mm -hmm. And he said, just stop there and put up the labs. He was getting frustrated hearing the presentation. The president put the labs up, and he gave a differential diagnosis of five to ten things. And I was also getting frustrated listening to the case. Right, right, right. I said, that was pretty magical. That was amazing. I, I want to be able to do that. And you've done that to us. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I, I, that, that's what inspired me the first right. time. And I said, you know, this is the only field where it's internal medicine based. I'm good at numbers. You know, I'm Indian, so we're good at numbers. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm good at math. So, right. so and, and then I was intrigued by the idea that you can get a definitive diagnosis without all the subjective history and physical. Mm. Because the numbers don't lie. So once you learn how to understand what the numbers should be, what they're going to be, what they could be, you can really formulate a better idea of the patient and have more definitive answers as opposed to, is it, I don't know what it is. You know? So I was always intrigued by that. Not really understanding dialysis and stuff, right, more, right, more right. the acid base, acute right. kidney injury right. part. And then uh, just from there, I decided to, I did internal medicine and I had the opportunity to do nephrology at LSU. And I stayed and did that after a chief year. And uh, I think it was the best decision I ever made. Recognizing my own weaknesses. I didn't like, I wasn't good at procedures. I was very impatient. I didn't like waiting mm. around for the team to show up for a cath or a scope. I didn't want to wake up in the middle of the night and have to go to the hospital unless it was an emergency. All those right. things, I was pretty honest with myself. And I chose a field that allowed me to kind of thrive with my skill set, but also the lifestyle I was desiring. You do, know? You, do you think that, do you think outside of the experience that I certainly had, do you think that exposure to what I would consider high quality nephrologists, mm -hmm. uh, do you think that's relatively still widespread? I don't know. I, I think nephrology is a field that has some real superstars out there, the mm. way they teach, and there's some real, uh, real people that struggle with explaining concepts in a meaningful way to residents. So one of the struggles in nephrology is attracting students and residents, and it really depends on their first exposure. That's true. You know, most of the time you get exposed to renal physiology as a med student, it's overwhelming, seems complicated and no one teaches it to you well. Right. It's like anything in the world. Like I can never be an oncologist because I didn't learn it well. Right. In my first rotation, it was taught to me terribly, complete turn off. So it really is, I think, function of who teaches you and when and your and your own aptitude. Right. You know, so uh, and I think that's what happens to students and residents now. If they're exposed to a great pulmonologist or cardiologist or oncologist, I mean, you can create anything. But nephrology is very sparse. There's very few people who have this sense who have, have not left academics. 
Mm. So they don't really understand the, the business piece of nephrology, what's out there. So to find someone who's got the business sense and the academic sense is challenging to, in today's world, which is why I think we struggle in nephrology to, front, to find applicants who are dynamic sometimes and, and want to get out there and, and showcase it is a nerd fest, to be very honest with you. You know, so even you know, I know my nephrology, but I, I get walked under the table if I go to an academic <laughs> nephrology place where they really know their nephrology. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, right. so you right. know, I'm good at it, but not not like the guys you know at LSU's and Tulane's and Oxford's of the world. They really get in the weeds. You yeah. know, that's a different type of nephrology. Right, you know, so, right. Uh, you know, that's definitely uh, a deeper nephrology. Yeah. Would you ever do something like that, Academ- academia? I could see it. I, I think at this point in my life, I just turned 50 this week and uh, Happy it, birthday. It, uh, <laughs> time to reflect on what's next. But I, I, I think this journey through medicine is very uh, unique. You have to put your time in at different stages mm-hmm. to build credibility, to build a resume, to develop the confidence, to be able to be a leader eventually. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, most young physicians aren't thinking about when they're 50 or 40, you know, and they probably should. But those first five, 10 years, you just have to just build you know, your resume, mm-hmm. what is your signature? Are you good at X, Y, or Z? And then that signature becomes your calling card going forward. And then you build confidence and then potentially, yeah. If I was offered the opportunity to lead an academic institution, I, I would, I don't think I'd say no. Mm-hmm. I, I think I'd strongly consider it. Uh, but also surround myself with people who could help me do the stuff I couldn't do well. But uh, yeah, I, I would not certainly close the door on that. Are there any aspects of your medical training that you think translate really well to your personal life? Hmm, that's, a, that's an interesting question. My medical training. I think training here at LSU, I trained at Charity Hospital, mm-hmm. pre-Katrina, and I had the opportunity to go to a small hospital, like I said, Lafayette, mm-hmm. Baton Rouge, but I was always drawn to the bigness and independence of that hospital. Even though I work in a smaller hospital now, yeah. I love that somewhat anonymity of the place, but it was just about you having to survive this tough place and being someone who could say that I trained there. That was, that's what drove me to be a resident there. And um, so in my personal life now, I think that's given me some grit and some self-confidence mm-hmm. that, you know, you're going to have some uncomfortable moments and you'll be by yourself and you have to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Just like in life, you know, you don't know what each day holds for you until you wake up every day. And I've drawn my residency all the time. If I'm in a place, I'm not having a good time. I said, it's only one night, it's not a month. Like I didn't like that rotation. Or, you know, I had a tough night, the yeah, call night or something. I've done that before. Mm-hmm. I did it every third night before. Mm-hmm. Now it's just one night once in a while. So certainly I think residency life should be harder than anything you're doing now. And it's like a very, yes. it, it prepares you for not only your medical career, but your career beyond that. And um, it certainly has prepared me for being married for a long time, <laughs> for being parent of two mm-hmm. high school graduates now, two college students now, and, and give you gives you that perseverance to, uh, to endure those ups and downs that certainly accompany that. In, in your experience, and we hear this all the time as, uh, as trainees for sure, back in my day, <laughs> has it changed for the better how training is? Um, yeah. And better could be subjective, but yeah. for what, what would you say would be some strong positives for how well or how different resident or mm-hmm. medical training is now yeah. compared to when you did it. So over the last two decades of the students and I've seen, I think clearly the, the entrance of the electronic medical record mm-hmm. has dramatically changed how we teach students and residents. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean it's thinking they're not as good. Right. It means it's, it, it, it's on us to create styles of lear- to create lectures and teaching styles that accommodate the modern learner. Mm. It used to be kind of a see one, do one, teach one, right? That was the, the mantra before when we were residents. You saw a procedure, you did one, then you taught one. Of course, right. that, that's not really relevant anymore for lots of reasons. Right. But I think on the other hand, it needs to be somewhat part of it so that st- people have a little feeling of uncomfortableness. You have to be uncomfortable to grow in any career or right. any field, particularly in medicine. Mm-hmm. That patient you're taking care of now at your hospital and I'm t- need me to have some tough days many years ago. I don't know if the residents now have as many tough days Mm. because of rules imposed around them, not because they don't want them, the right. rules imposed around them, the shift to outpatient medicine versus inpatient medicine, mm-hmm. those sorts of things have created a different learning environment. So it, I think the students and residents have to be more uh, aggressive to do things now before they just roll around you. There's right, a procedure right, to do. Right, right, you don't right. have to go find it. Right. Now you have to seek it out and create uh, situations, even simulations where students and residents can learn and be made uncomfortable. So you can do it still. Mm-hmm. But I think it's it's attracting a different type of student, sometimes a resident, who doesn't seek out 
that sort of feeling. Yeah. <clears throat> not everyone. Right, right, right. I think you can, you know who wants it and who doesn't. Right, right. Before, even if you didn't want it, you had to do it. <laughs> there was no escaping right. the ICU charity, right? Or the, or the ER charity. The you heart, were down there. You had, to, you had to survive down there. Right. It was, there was nowhere to hide, is my point. The hard times were always coming, I imagine. At least that's what he's spoken about. I, what's, I, what's that? F- the, the, f- the quote that a lot of attendings say, I used to walk in snow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uphill. Both, both ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't say it's that bad, but I would say, for example, one example is the caps, right? So when I was in training, there was no caps on admissions. Mm. And there was no mandatory day off every seven days. Right, right, right. Oh. So <laughs> we, we, you got a day off here and there, but there was no mandatory day. Right. Now, now, I'm not right. saying that's good, but that's what a function of that was you saw a lot more patients. Right. And you had to do a lot more stuff. But on the flip side, there might have been patient safety issues that were never made away, they didn't manifest themselves right. because no one was watching it. So I think at the right where we are now is good, great for patients and patient safety. And we have to create better environments for residents to learn uh, to challenge them and push them to, to be uncomfortable. Yeah. And me- medicine is an experience field, it's, oh, yeah. it's so dependent on experience because I would make the argument that post medical school, you need to see as much as possible. Oh, no doubt. And and that's that's li- that's really how you learn. You just need to see as much as possible. Um, so I can imagine how, especially back then, how how much that impacted stepping out of your training with confidence. Yeah, you should. There used to be saying you should never have seen something in real life that you hadn't seen in residency. Mm. And my dad told me that. My dad was an anesthesiologist at Charity Hospital. Right, right, right. And right. he said he thinks in his whole career he might have seen one complication as an anesthesiologist that he hadn't seen before as a resident. Wow. So he saw it all. Yeah, he was in the late 70s working on the 12th floor at Charity Hospital as an anesthesia resident. He told me a lot of his war stories, which attracted me to want to go there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a very cool story because we graduated 20 years apart in med school. Mm. So my dad came back as an older student later. So, and um, he was in med school as an immigrant, and then he didn't do well the first semester in 1966, and he dropped out. Oh, okay. And then he tried to get back in, and didn't get back in until 1974. So for eight years, he didn't get back in the same class that he dropped out of. Right, right, right. So that right. taught perseverance. So, mm-hmm. so when I didn't get in the first time, he told me to quit wine. And <laughs> he said, try, <laughs> try seven times, great time. <laughs> right. So, but, but I want, so we're in this, we're the same, frater- we're in the same fraternity. Mm-hmm. We're both charity hospital residents. We're both LSU graduates. And our LSU reunions are interesting. They're five years at a time. Mm. So we have 20 years apart. So we share the same reunion year. So we just uh, went to our reunion. It was my 25th and his 45th. So we just went together to the reunion. So it gives me a lot of pride when I go with him to those things. And I know his classmates. He knows my classmates. That's amazing. It's really kind of pretty, uh, you know, um, uh, tearjerker. Yeah, you go yeah, there. It's pretty cool. That's amazing. Yeah. I'm sure, like, I'm sure it's really cool to see. Do a lot of people come back to those reunions? Yes. You'd be surprised. It's a, in my reunions, we had probably 50 people. We had a class of yeah. uh, 175. We had about 50 people come to my class, but mm-hmm. his class was similar. Mm-hmm. You know, there was probably 35, 40 people there, and they're wow. all 75 years old, you know, between 70 and 75, you know. So, um, you know, we have one common friend, uh, you know, Seth Haydell, you and I. Yeah. Know. So Seth's uh, uncle was there, too, for his class. I think it was the class above my dad's, five years ahead. Ah. So he made a funny story. He goes, oh, you're the Dr. Gupta from Shabir. Oh, look at that. So he, we had a funny moment at, at the reunion where he had never met me in person. Mm. I knew his name. So but all LSU tied together because all these people stay here, right? right? So all people went to LSU med school, 70% practice in the state. Oh, really? I didn't know it was that yeah. high a percentage. Yeah, that's how it used to be. Seven in 10 graduates from the LSU practice somewhere in Louisiana. Wow. So that's the beauty of the state med school. Mm. The most people stick around and provide care to the people who need the most. Right. You know, so that's, uh, and our Shawbear experience is very similar. Right. People who go there tend not to leave. Right. But no matter where they came from. Mm-hmm. So then you build a little mini network right there in the, in those, in Terrebonne Parish, Lafourche Parish to take care of these people who need it most, you know. I'm curious to see, uh, I like the five-year interval between the graduations because you yeah. could probably make a a retrospective study out of that. What's the percentage of practicing doctors each oh, sure. five-year incre- increment? Yeah, definitely. Um, I wonder how many people in your dad's class are still practicing. Right, right. Um, yeah, most are not in his class anymore, but a handful are. I, I'm some of his classmates I've worked with. They knew I was my, his son. Obviously, they mm-hmm. were LSU professors. You know, and, and kind of like I get, I'm, I haven't seen any of my residence kids yet. So <laughs> not that old yet. <laughs> I won't be long. I won't be surprised. I've been working at Shabbos since 2002. Oh, yeah. Somebody's so not, someone's somebody, kids coming through. I, I, I won't coming. be surprised at all. If one of those early students in residence 
One of their kids is now Somebody's probably going to med coming. school and about to show up. So Somebody, it's coming. about to happen, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's, exci- it's exciting. We, uh, should, we should do a reunion for Shabir. Yeah, no, no That'd doubt. Be awesome. Yeah, Our classes aren't big, but still, it'd be really yeah, You've cool got 100 too. residents now because you have oh, had yeah. 15. This will be the 15th class, I think, that gra- just graduated. No, I'm sorry, uh, the thir- 12th to 13th class mm. with eight people per class. So we're close to 100 graduates. Wow. Yeah. Because the first class are in 08, so the first graduate were 2011. Oh, yeah. So the 12 years of graduates now, and you do eight per year. We had a few years that didn't have eight. So we're probably about 90, between 90 and 100 yeah. trainees that are planted all over the country now. That's amazing. Yeah, it, it is. That is amazing. I remember going to Xavier, because I worked at Xavier before I went to right. medical school. Told me, yeah. So I remember going there, and that was my first time actually thinking about residency. Mm-hmm. So that experience. And I... Yeah. I I'm, I'm thankful that I matched that Shari. I think yeah. I always wanted to come back. I, I consider South Louisiana my home. I'm not from here, but this place is, I'm indebted to it in so many ways. Yeah. So, so much of what has happened to me that's good right. as an adult has happened here. I agree. Um, yeah. So it's very, it's, it's a very, very, I'm very attached to South Louisiana, Homa, yeah. Thibodeau, Nickel State. And yeah. New Orleans. Yeah, the uh, the pool is strong. You know, I didn't grow up here either, but my children are both New Orleanians. Mm-hmm. And they're both in school here in town. But um, we told encourage them to go away, but I think they're going to come back, even if they do go away. All I right. can see it. They love the place. They love how it is. They love what it gives to them, not only culturally and food and drink, also all that everybody knows about, but that family that ties, yeah. uh, those deep connections yeah. that you make with different groups of people, the diversity, you know, that some people don't like. Right. Uh, some, to me, it's what makes a place the place. Right. You know, and I'm not just talking about racial diversity. I'm talking about all kinds of diversity, you know, geographic, economic, uh, careers, you know, all those things that make us such a unique place um, are hard to duplicate other places if you've lived here. Mm-hmm. You go somewhere else, it's obviously absent. Right. You know, and it's not accessible. Right. If, if they have it, you can't ex- experience it like you can here. Right. Yeah. I always make the case that in New Orleans, you could, you could drop yourself in the middle of, say, New York, Chicago, Dallas, Houston, you may not be able to discern the difference between those cities, right. but right. you drop yourself in the middle of New Orleans. It, it doesn't take long, and you know you're. Yeah, I'm. I'm somewhere different. Yeah, this place is not. It's uniquely un-American, but very American. Yeah, um, very very special. Yeah, well, I'll tell. You, I'll, I'll just share a few things that happened the last few days. It's been amazing. So, you know, I turned my birthday as I alluded to. But my brother and sister took me out to uh, and my our spouses to dinner last Friday mm-hmm. downtown. Then we went to see the Chappelle show. We no, were there. That, yeah, that was Friday. It was amazing. Yeah. And they made all the Homa jokes, right? Yeah, yeah, the open, yeah, yeah, the opening, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. The opening act was yeah. all Duke and I was yeah. mess, messing with Homa. Um, yeah. And then uh, and on Monday, I was at uh, Commander's Palace for dinner with my wife and children. Mm-hmm. Amazing, right? And then next week, I have some colleagues for business coming to town, and I'm the New Orleans guy, so I have to set up all the dinners. So I'm, I have a dinner extravaganza next week between <laughs> Pesh and Arno's and Clancy's, and, and I'm, I can't wait. It's right. going to be one thing after the other, and right. it's going to be each day is going to be different and unique. And I think we get spoiled when you have access to those kinds of places and you can experience them however you want. Right. Casual, f- formal. You get to know the people who own the restaurants. I think people take that for granted in other places. And living in one place for this long, we've been here for almost 30 years now, we build deep relationships with not only, and they're our friends, people we patronize at restaurants and they remember you and they remember your table. Those little things just don't happen other places. I remember something you told me um, in... Many, a few years ago, you were mentioning that the access to a good time, I don't know if you remember this, mm-hmm. access to a good time in New Orleans, is, is, there's no socioeconomic uh, limitation to that. Right. You, you can have the level of good time that the, high, the richest person is, is having, right. and no one knows the difference. No, it, exactly. It doesn't take much to go from... Good to great or great to right, best. Right. You know, you can get a po' boy and a beer and have a great time. Absolutely. Sending some sending someone else who's a gazillionaire. Right. Or you can be the Saints game and you're all bonding over the of the Saints. Right. right. It doesn't matter who, what anybody does. Right. So the accessibility factor here is not only distance wise but also just being there is so different than other places. Yeah. You know, it's hard to go experience it in like you said in Chicago, Dallas. These the distances, the expense. Mm. You can never change your plan in one night because you already invested right, in parking right, right, and right. driving and this and that. So here, if someone's not working, you just take an Uber and go somewhere else, right. you know, or call your buddy and, and go meet them for whatever. You know, right. I think that's the grow. It gets part becomes part of you when you live here for a long enough time. That's what most people don't leave either. Who come here to go to school or work? Yeah. A lot of them end up staying. 
even right. if not from here originally. I, Absolutely. I, I, I've found. So yeah, it's a very, uh, it's an amazing place. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I want to, I've always actually wanted to ask you about, because your dad is a physician. Right. Did you feel like you had to be one? You know, I'm the oldest in my family. I have two siblings, mm -hmm. uh, Indian immigrant family here. Mm -hmm. I was never pressured to become a doctor, but you know, cliches and stereotypes. I was a good student. You know, I did well in school. And I just, I never thought I'd do something else, to be mm -hmm. very frank with you. But as I went through school, I really liked a lot of things that probably were not going to be practical options. If I told my dad I wanted to be a journalist, which I did, mm. loved. I was, a, I wrote for my school newspaper and I was really into all that. And, but at that time, this was, you know, it just wasn't a meaningful option. Didn't come up. So at least now in today's world, you can explore right, those things. But right. no, to answer your question, no. I never thought about doing anything else as a career. But I didn't want to be an anesthesiologist. I wanted to be an old-fashioned doctor. I wanted to be someone who saw patients and could answer questions and make right. a diagnosis. And that kind of doctor was what I was always attracted to, not, not a technician or a, a super specialist or mm -hmm. someone who read x-rays or right, just right, did anesthesia. Right, right. I, didn't, I thought that wasn't going to be stimulating enough for me to do it. So if you couldn't be a doctor now, what yeah. would you be? Oh yeah, I, I would. I, I love investigative journalism and stuff like that. Really? Yeah. In a minute. In a really? Minute. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I was always. I, I wrote for my school newspaper. I had a couple of, um, maybe not for the podcast, but I had some run-ins where I got myself in a little bit of trouble for yeah. writing about a couple of things that <laughs> were controversial from a school perspective. Right, like right, right. Exposés of some oh, wow. sort. Yeah, and so you know, um, and and I loved it. I, I really enjoyed it, and it was fun and stimulating and exciting and. You know, and uh, would you ever write a book? Because I know you lo you love to read books. One yeah, of, one of my favorite books is right over there. Is uh, make your bed that you yeah that yeah. you you uh, you gave us all a copy from yeah, mistake graduation and, yeah. yeah for graduation. Yeah. Um, would you ever write a book? Yeah, I, I don't know if I'd write a book book like a full blown book, but I think uh, you know, small essays or like short not short story essays about yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I think is important or life journeys and mm -hmm. helping people understand what's coming next when you don't know. I think I would love to do that. And I've cataloged a few things I do want to write about at some point, but I, I don't want to force it. I want to, it's like your podcast. It right. probably came at, you probably thinking about it and you decided to do it for some reason. Right, now. right, right. I'm waiting for that moment Thing. to hit me from where I want to just go do it. But in the meanwhile, I'm just data gathering at the moment um, about stuff I'd like to write about or uh, blog about, you know, or stuff like that. I think it's an amazing time we're living in where you can actually yeah. get your story out there. If it resonates with one person or five people or ten people, that's enough. That's great. Yeah. I mean, if it takes off, even better. But you know, it's just a way for you to express yourself mm -hmm. in a very uh, personal way mm -hmm. uh, and expose yourself as much as you like. You know, so what 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 would be some like an advice you'd give to anyone that wants to do medicine, yep. shares somewhat of a similar background to you, yeah, and. I, I love being well-rounded yep. and, I, and I hope to become more well-rounded as I, as I continue. Yeah. Outside of, you know, study hard, sure. every, you know, stay focused. Yeah. What would be a really good, what are some good tips that you could yeah. give to someone outside of medicine to help them be m more well-rounded yeah. in such a way that it, it augments their no, medical I, that's experience? That's a great question. I think, you know, medicine can be all-consuming and yeah. I think, at times of your life, it has to be. Like when yeah. you first start working, when you start finish your training, you have to invest the time to build that reputation. Mm -hmm. The beautiful thing about it is once you build it, it kind of is self-fulfilling and self-sustaining because you know, you're a good doctor, a nice doctor, a friendly doctor, a smart doctor, whatever you get defined right. as sticks with you right. for the most part. But it takes a couple years to build that. But in the meantime, you, know, you have to have something you're doing outside of medicine that gets you away from it because medicine is very demanding, not only physically, but mentally. Right. And oftentimes our spouses and others aren't privy to that if they're not in the field. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to bring that home, but you need something to get away from that world. So to answer your question, I would say have something you love to do that only you like to do. You right. know, so, you know, I, for example, when I, I love to coach my kids sports, that was my release early on when mm -hmm. I first had a young family, but I always wanted to be home for dinner and be with them no matter what it took to do that. I'd go earlier in the morning to be home for dinner. So that kind of grounded me in the early part of my career. Then it was getting involved in their lives at school, coaching. Uh, my daughter didn't play sports, but things she did at school, she was in the arts. You want to be there. Being there for everything for her. Getting involved at, the, at your school or wherever your kid's school is. If there's an opportunity to be involved or your National Kidney Foundation mm -hmm. or whatever it is, give back somewhere where you can ground yourself and make that part of your day, not an extra thing you're doing. Mm. It's got to be part of your routine, like exercises or eating right. right or going out with your wife or husband on the weekends. You know, you have to build the time in. It can't be an extra. And once you prioritize it, everything else tends to fall in place and you'll 
by definition become balanced. Right, right, right. If you're waiting to finish one thing, then do something else. I, when I get to this level, I'm going to do this. It, it doesn't work that way. You have to kind of have parallel work streams going all the time. Because right. what you plant today will reap benefits. Well, benefits later. So if you volunteer for something today or join some organization today, in five years, you'll be the leader of that organization. Right, right. But you just can't start out of nowhere. Right. You know, one example, I joined the Kidney Foundation as a new grad, just mm -hmm. getting involved to meet people, mm -hmm. got on a couple of committees, and then 10 years later, I'm the Kidney Foundation president mm -hmm. for three years. And that's opened tremendous doors for me because now I'm confident. I have a practice. I have an identity. And now that identity has taken me to other opportunities I never would have had otherwise, mm. if, you, if that makes sense. Right, so right, right, so right. you're laying the foundation for your future activities every time you do something. It doesn't just stop when you, or start from fresh when you're a new grad. Yeah. And it doesn't just start again when you're 40 or when you're 50. It has to be layered, and you have to plan for it. You just have to. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think people don't do that often. And all of a sudden, well, how are you doing with all the stuff you're doing? Well, I'm doing it because I've been working on this foundation for 10, 15 years. Right. I'm doing it because uh, I was coaching at that organization from the time my kid was nine. Mm. Uh, how are you on the board at your kid's school? Because I volunteered to be on a committee when they were in third grade. Right. And I gave back to the school. So, you know, like-minded people want to uh, invite other people to be with them as leaders. And you got to show that you've done the, put the time in them. Mm -hmm. And the meaning not just not for show, because you want to do it. Right. So pick something you're passionate about and go all in on it. For me, it was home dialysis, for example. I right. went home dialysis. I went all in on home dialysis. Mm -hmm. It's defined me as a physician now. It's gotten me, opened plenty of doors for me beyond whatever I could have imagined. Wow. Because it's, you're confident. You know, right. you, you right. built credibility. Right. Because you built it. You know? yeah, so you have to just be deliberate about Very. that aspect of Very. it. Very. Wow. Whether it's your uh, spousal relationship. Yeah. Like my wife and I would go to dinner every Friday or Saturday. You had a babysitter, standing babysitter. Right. Didn't matter. We didn't use them. We still paid them because we had the, need the option to go we out. The to. two of us, right, right. Uh, you know, and the, the other stuff I mentioned to you. But yeah, it has to be non-negotiable. Some of these things, mm. and of course, you change. But I'm saying, if you don't build it in, it doesn't happen. And you're not thinking about what you're going to be in five, ten years. You asking the question about you know leading an organization like mm -hmm. an academic place. If I want to do that, I have to start planning for that now. Right, right. I have to talk to the university. I have to let them know my name. Get them get to know me. Maybe. Be gratty, gratis to mm -hmm. clinics, and then five, ten years from now, oh yeah, he's been working with us for ten years. We know him. He, he'd Bring be him he'd be perfect, right? But it's hard to get that job out of nowhere, right? Right. <laughs> you you know? have to expose yourself yeah. and be deliberate about exposing yourself yeah. to those opportunities. No, no, mo most definitely. And I encourage folks like you, same way. You know, you're just pretty new out of training. You've worked mm -hmm. for a few years. You know, you're going to build, blaze your own path, but decide where you want to be. You know, is this you know your what you're doing now? Is this your passion, or is this one of the things you like to do, or mm -hmm. do you imagine yourself being in hospital leadership, or you know leading another organization, or you know mayor of New Orleans, you know? <laughs> governor, uh, of Louisiana. governor of Louisiana? <laughs> I'd support your campaign. I think I'm Ugo. I'd run for governor. I'd have to talk to my wife first. <laughs> So, well, you so you can't do anything bad right now, so you can't get in trouble right I now. I know I have to be, I have to be very. <laughs> you have to be clean. You have to be clean. Maybe Louisiana, you can get away with it. The Louisiana, probably, if you're too clean, not getting elected. Yeah, know, you got to be, got a little bit of baggage. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, he's normal. He's just like us. Yeah, you need to be a little bit. You know, you yeah. can't walk too straight. <laughs> not here. Not, yeah, not, not to here. be a politician here. So if if I if I was to ask a 20 year old or you 20 years ago, yeah, and what. What do they think of who you would be today? How different is that? How different are you from who you thought you'd be? Oh yeah, well, very different. Uh, you know, I was, I'm a planner, I'm a type A, mm. firstborn. You know, I was gonna join a practice in New Orleans, I was gonna become a partner, I was gonna mm -hmm. own a dialysis center, I was gonna be hanging out over here, and I really had no thought beyond that, to be wow. honest with you. I wanted to be a husband and a dad and mm -hmm. push my kids and be part of their lives in very general sense. Not, I had no idea of the opportunities that are out there mm. beyond medicine. None. I was just very narrow, like very right. tunnel visioned right. about making a good living, providing for my family, and nothing else. What I've done now is uh, I built something that's become sustainable, and I'm doing things I never could have imagined. I'm working in, in a corporate medical job in addition to my job at, at Shaw Bear. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm the chairman of our department. I never thought I'd be an academic chairman of a small right. hospital right. department. I never could have imagined that. And then the corporate work I'm doing now is really building something that could change the way we practice medicine across our country in terms of delivering healthcare in, in a specially focused way, which again, never could have imagined right. I'd have that opportunity. Right. And, and it, it's very gratifying. 
So, you know, but in some ways, yes, I'm, I'm straight and narrow. I, I've been married. My wife and I have been married for 26 years. Yeah. Uh, I have two beautiful children, 22-year-old daughter and, a, and an 18-year-old son, 21 and 18. And uh, they both ended up staying in town for school, which I, we didn't push for that, but it happened. Right. Yes, but, o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. So my, yeah, my daughter's a senior at Tulane and she'll be graduating in art history and business. And my son, Yash, is a business major freshman. And he's an Indian Division One football player, yeah, which is a, a zebra in of itself. <laughs> it's <a> zebra. <laughs> that might be the only the only zebra. Yeah, but right. I, I'll tell you a funny story how far things have come. One of the, one of the things I want to write about is in mm-hmm. my phone things mm-hmm. to write about. I was watching the Tulane game last week, and my son's a freshman, and he doesn't play yet. He's a walk on. He's trying to move up the depth chart. But I saw three guys' last names kind of stand next to each other. I saw Gupta, I saw Kim, and I saw Lou. <laughs> L-I-U, and it came I said, what are we doing here? They have three right. Asian football players on a Division One team dressed out. I said, we've come a long way as <laughs> Asian Absolutely. people who've come, immigrants who've come here, and no one's asking him if he wants to be a doctor. Right. Right? So, right. Wow. so I thought yeah. that was pretty remarkable in one generation to see that shift, which I'm very excited about mm-hmm. seeing going forward, that people can do whatever they want if they apply themselves and put the time in and get the support they need. And I, I think uh, reflecting back to where I was 20 years ago, I never could have imagined this is where I'd be sitting right. now. And I don't even know what it's going to be like in the next five or 10 years. Right. I, I'm, I'm excited to find out. Right. But uh, it's been a great journey uh, doing it, you know, with the constant being right. Louisiana, same job for all these years. It's really given me a lot of perspective uh, on seeing something from one place, Right. You know, which some people don't get. And I, I'm very aware of it, asking about regrets, but... If you could change anything, yeah. what would you change? Oh, yeah. Uh, easy question for me. I would have left for a while. Mm. I never left here. Um, I would have left for one part of my training at least or gone somewhere else to live somewhere and right. immerse myself somewhere. Obviously, probably coming back. Mm-hmm. But I, I missed that window and opportunity. I, I frankly was just a little scared and lazy to mm-hmm. do it. I could have, but I just didn't. And uh, I, in retrospect, I wish I would have done that. Um you know, I, I think that's the only one I would say, obviously, it, it would have may have changed me. It may mm-hmm. have given me a, a different credibility level. Right. When you don't leave here and, and you want to apply for things, you kind of get viewed as a local smoke. Like you don't. You as don't, a you homer? Can, yeah. Like you can't go anywhere else or maybe you can't cut it somewhere else. That's why mm. you didn't go. And I, I have that when I my, my job in, in corporate America where I work now, I do fight that image of being the Louisiana guy. And, you know, he's smart and he's good and he's this and that. But. In that world, you have to have, have, that's the chip. The chip is, where have you been? And what are you doing? I didn't know that when I was, because I never thought I'd be where I'm sitting right now. So I got there through a building a a model and a brand of of medicine that's resonating with people now, because it's a business advantage to it Mm -hmm. now. Before, it was just a patient advantage. But I think in retrospect, to be part of that circle or to have opportunities there, you have to put some sort of time in. Somewhere else. Somewhere else that's, that's got a reputation or reputable, not an institution maybe, but right. not a university I'm talking about, just right. some sort of time in a hospital or working in a big time hospital or something. Yeah, it just, yeah. it, just it, it, it means a lot yeah. in that space. It doesn't mean you can't succeed without it, but it's right. harder. It's harder. Hmm. Well, that's interesting because I, I always, I, I wonder if there's a correlation between children of immigrants and how many of them stick around versus the opposite. Yeah. So, so families that come from here, yeah. How, how what percentage of them leave versus the children of immigrants that come here and are born here? Yeah, no, that that's uh, that's that'd be an interesting thing to observe. I mean, that immigrant culture is so. I, th- I think it depends on how much culture you have where you are already. If you live in a big city where there's a lot of people of your mm. ethnicity, origin, or, or community, it's probably a little easier. You know, here we don't have a lot of. Nigerian, Jamaican, right, Indian, right, Indian, right. we have, but not a lot, not a lot right. enough to have a core group. Right. So the family ends up being the core group. Right. So I don't know. It's an interesting thought to see um, what people would do. I think New Orleans is, is unique in that the place is the community. Right. You don't it's need, a village. You don't need uh, people from your own tribe. You, you, New Orleans is the tribe. Right. Which right. I think makes it such a unique place. And I think you can extrapolate it out to Southwest Louisiana mm-hmm. in general. Um, so maybe our place is where we are drawn to our, is our community right. for us specifically I'm talking about uh, as opposed to other people who are more fleeting and could live anywhere like you alluded right. to in, earlier in the podcast if you went to school in Stanford you could go to Penn or you can go to Harvard right. you could go to wherever right because right. you're just going from one place to another it's right. very similar and we don't and we don't have that right 
you know. I, I, I'm, I think because I wonder what my kids would do. Yeah. Like, are they going to, will they stay or will they want to leave? Yeah. Or is, will, be, will, will being here be stale to them? It, it maybe won't have that. I don't think that, I don't know, the, the New Orleans' big danger is its government structure and infrastructure. Mm. I don't think it's the, the funness of the place. Like, my kids could go anywhere to live if they wanted to, but they're probably going to stay here right. or come back to here. Right. I'm encouraging them to go, what, is what I just said. Right, right, right. Go for a bit and come back you know, after three, four, five years if you want to, because then you have that on your, on your resume that you went somewhere else. Right. And you tried it out, and now you're bringing that knowledge back to here. So I, I think it's going to be interesting to see if New Orleans can get their act together and give us the infrastructure we need to, for these children, adults in the future to live and thrive, then we have a fighting chance. Uh, I just, I'm just concerned about that piece. I don't think it's going to be the culture of the fun. Right, right. They're going to stay because of that. That's, that. That never gets stale. <laughs> That's a fact. <laughs> yes. I mean, Sundays in the dome never get stale. You know? I love it. <laughs> I mean, and, and those boys are playing right now, too. Yeah. So thank goodness. So, it, it's, uh, so <clears> I'm just thinking <throat> my own kids' experience. You know, they end up going to the same places we go to. As they've gotten older, they like to partake in the same types of food. They like right. to get to know the owners, and they're roaming around. And, oh, I saw your, your daughter here last week, or I saw your son here. The same shopkeepers will tell you that. You know, oh, really? Okay, I haven't seen them all week. Oh, they got right. food from here last week. Oh, great. You know, so it's, uh, that's very cool, I think. I think that's nice about New Orleans. I, I think one of my favorite things about you is your, <clears throat> you, you mentioned how, you know, type A, you know, very organized, <laughs> how deliberate you are about so much of how you um, execute your your actions, and one of my favorite things is, is you brought up your kids a bunch of times. Yeah, I've I've seen you and your kids interact, and a, a lesson that I take from that is that I want my kids to grow up to be people I like being around. Right, and that's a lesson I learned from you and your kids. <laughs> right, so um, what do you think? I mean, you you're not not busy. I mean, I know right. you're busy. Right. So how did you? I know I know you're being very deliberate about it. Yeah. But how how do you do that? Yeah. Traveling an hour to Homa, an hour yeah. back, and and I, you know I, I think I've had the luxury, and, and not all, but not everybody does. Right. Of kind of controlling my own schedule all these years. So you know if I need to be back at four o'clock in New Orleans, I'm finished clinic at two thirty. I'll just mm. go early, and I have the ability in that hospital, which is what draws me to it too. I probably couldn't do that in town. That's fair. I'd have missed a lot of things, even though it was closer. Right. So the ho- the hospital afforded me the opportunity, the flexibility, but I was also disciplined to get up early and go and and, knock and, it and out. I said, I'm not missing this. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it back. But I, I think with your kids, they as they get older, they realize that that when you did come, and they they don't know how busy you are when they're five and six, like That's your true. kids, but they don't know how busy you are right no, now. No. But like my, for my, my my daughter wrote me a card for the birthday. Says your actions don't go unnoticed. Mm. All the stuff you do, all the effort you make, does not go unnoticed to me. Because I know you're doing all these different things, and I hope to be doing the same stuff like you when I'm in, in your shoes one day. That's amazing. So I'm saying that's, that fills you with pride, right? Because that means they are watching and mm-hmm. seeing, and you don't have to be obvious about it to them because they grow up to be people, right? right. Who right. have brains and right. see things and observe right. things. Right. And, they'll re- they, and they know you can't beat everything, right? And then you got a job. But I think that's the part to me that's most important is being consistent and deliberate, as you use the terminology, and knowing what how much it means to you too, it, it, how much you're getting out of it too, right? And it's not just being there to check box for your kids that you were there. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I can't wait for, you know, tomorrow, Saturday, right? Two lanes playing Nichols tomorrow. Yes. All right, so yes. Nichols State's coming to town. Go Crowns. Uh, and my son said it's a Nichols Super Bowl tomorrow, so they got to come. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> you know, it's the Super Bowl for Nichols oh tomorrow, coming to the big, big city to play, uh, you know, ranked team. So I can't wait to go out there, even though my son's probably not going to play tomorrow. He might if he blow nickels out. So that's how I'm going. <laughs> Probably will. <laughs> so, I do so, love me some nickels. No, I'm kidding. So my point is, I just can't wait to be out there and be a dad tomorrow. I don't. I don't. My name's not Doctor Anything tomorrow. I'm just gonna wear my Gupta jersey, walking around, you know, drinking beers, walking around, and having a good time. That's awesome. And I can't wait. That's and, awesome. and, and that's all I'm gonna do tomorrow. And, and I can't wait to be in the dome next weekend. I mean, the, you can shift gears and really enjoy it and enjoy that with your family and mm-hmm. kids, whether you're not mm-hmm. a doctor, right? You're right. their dad or their you're the husband or you're the, whatever your title is, you know, there's a very famous quote, um, um, Alan Alda, you may not even know who Alan Alda is. He was an uh, actor at MASH and a very famous actor. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, uh, and so apparently, you know, he gave a commencement speech and I, one of my mentors told me this, so I'm re- reciting something, it's not, I don't, that he told me, you know, you, you're going to think your first name is Doctor. Your mom didn't name you Doctor. Right, so that's not your name, right? Your, your name is your name. So d- be, sh- be deliberate about your roles when you're at work. Yeah, you're the doctor, but when you're at home, you're not, okay? And, and you need to 
clear those demarcations and, and do what you need to do. Yeah. Isn't that a shift too from old medicine yep. where being a doctor was the the main right. driving mm-hmm. personality of who you were? Correct. Um, and that shift to now being someone who is a doctor as opposed to being I am the doctor. No, I, I agree. I, I think that's a good thing. You know, I think the work-life balance that probably, probably just previous to you started mm-hmm. entering into the, the, uh, the mindset is a good thing. You know, I think we still have to be there for our patients. Right, and, right. And there are certain patients you'll be there for all the time and right. they'll have your number and they'll call you, but you have to learn to disconnect because it's emotionally very draining and trying and, and difficult and disruptive right. you know, if you don't set those boundaries. And it's okay not to be there all the time. You right. have a, another life you have to lead. But we grow into that role. It's, it's hard because you are so driven by taking care of these people that you go grow close to right. and you have an obligation to them. So it's, you have to balance it, you know, and I think that's a good thing that we've exper- we're experiencing that uh, split um, in, in our approach now and, and having the support and people recognize you when you're off, you should be off, you know, cause it's mental well being is important. You know, I, yeah. I'll be very frank. I thought it was kind of hokey, you know, I mean, I mean, look, I mean, I, I would, Oh, come on, man, toughen up, you know, do right, all that. Right, but right. I, I, I see it, you know, you see it in residents, you see it in patients, you see it in family members, that mental well being and rest is important, you know, to, to incorporate. And if someone's getting burnt out, you, they need some time, you know, and to, to get back on their feet, and you have to recognize that. So, I think one of one of my favorite things is essentially to make sure that whenever you present yourself, you're presenting your best self, mm-hmm. and that requires some work behind the scenes. Oh, definitely. So if it means taking that time off to recharge, so yeah. that when you see your patients, you, you're the best version of yourself, right, for your patients. Um, well, I think you know doctors get in trouble because. You know, no one cares if you're having a bad day. That's true. I mean, you need to deliver to these patients. Your, they're your customers. Right. Consistently every time. If you're having a bad day, maybe you stay home. But you can't go and lose your mind at the hospital and let people have it because you're having a rough day. Right. That's unacceptable. And that's when people set their reputations, as I was talking mm. about earlier. You, know, you can be firm and strict and, and to the point, but you, you can't be rude to anyone. You know, and, and if, you're, if you're having those moments, you got to recognize it. If you do lose your mind... You need to apologize and get back on track. Right. Everybody has a bad day. Right, right. But don't put yourself in a situation where I'm the doctor. You know, I have so many things to do. No one cares. Right. And, and it's not good to practice that way. And then you get labeled. And then it's very hard to shake that label. Like you said. Once you get it, it's hard, it's hard to shake it. But if you're the other way around, meaning you have a great reputation to have a bad day, you just had a bad day. Right. People give you the benefit of the doubt. Right. And then you can come back and redeem yourself and get come back to the table. Because I think all of us in medicine, clinical folks understand that you have rough days right. and something must be impacting you that made right. you act that way. But I think too many doctors don't recognize that that's very, very important to you know, take that deep breath when, before you walk in the hospital and be ready for... Because in medicine, you never know what's going to be there. That's true. You, know, you don't know. It could be an easy day. It could be hard to... I was sharing with the residents at graduation uh, a kind of an approach to life a little bit. You know, I so said when you're young, you, you, know, you think nothing's going to happen to you. Everything's great. Nothing bad ever happens, right? Uh, you know, whatever. Yeah, I'm just going to get through it. When you're a little bit older, working, young professional, young family, you know, you hope nothing bad happens. Like, please, nothing bad happen. <laughs> like, make my car work. Right, nothing happen. Right. I don't have any problems today. Make sure my right. ACs work. And you're like hoping nothing bad happens. Things bad happen and how you respond to it. Mm-hmm. When you're older, you know something bad is going to happen. <laughs> and if it doesn't, it was a really good day. That's a good day. <laughs> so you're like, plan- but you're ready for, your, your approach is different. You know, they have the worst, but you know, something's going to happen, mm-hmm. somewhere's going to impact you. You know, there'll be a traffic delay. Mm-hmm. There'll be something going on here. There'll be some, some, somebody didn't show up for work, you know, and you just roll with it and deal with it because you get experience. So I think that's the evolution you have in work as a, as a spouse, as a parent, you know, all those sorts of right, things, right, you know, right. so... My kids call me now, you know, I, I've evolved from, oh, so something bad. Right, when right, they were right. in high school and all, right. now it's like, oh, okay, you, it, maybe you just call to say hello. Right, right. Because <laughs> they do call to say hello. Right. So my mind has gotten less, uh, I'm, on, I'm not on edge as much when the phone rings, but still a little bit, you know, so. That's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, this was awesome. Yeah, it's yeah. fun. It's fun. Well, I wish you the best, Ugo. I really have been uh, proud of you seeing Thank how you. far you've come, and, you know, and this is not because I'm on your podcast, but... <laughs> You know, we know the minute we meet a resident or a student, you know who's going to make it. There's some, you know, not going to make it. Right. There's a lot in the middle who will make it, but you're not really sure at the beginning. Right. But you certainly were in that first group, you know, that when you meet somebody, and, and, and I know firsthand 
being in Homa and you being at the, our sister, sister hospital there, that your reputation is, is excellent. And uh, we even have a couple of common patients. Yeah. You know, and I said, oh, I see Dr. Ugo. I said, oh, I know Dr. Ugo. He's a very good doctor. He trained here. Yeah. <laughs> so, I tell them all the time. So I tell so them all I, the time. We, we toot our, you know, pat ourselves on the back because you came from us and we take pride in that. And we really are uh, enjoying your success and, and the, uh, the trail you're blazing. And I can't wait to see what you do next, too. So. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks yes, for sir. having me. Yes, sir. Yeah. How do we do?